This is Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of Open Your Eyes. Everybody's interested in what makeup does to the eye, which makeup to use that's safe for the eye. They want to know about wrinkles. They want to know about puffiness under the eyes. And what can we do about it? Well, today we have an expert in this area, Dr. Jennifer Lyerly. She is an optometrist in Raleigh, North Carolina. She specializes in contact lenses and ocular aesthetics. She has her own website called Idology, which is for the public. Did I say that right? Idology? Idolatry. Uh, idolatry, I'm sorry. And uh, she's been published in many articles, magazines, medical journals. She has her own podcast where she's the co-host. It's called Defocus. So warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Lyerly. Jennifer, how did you get involved in such an interesting topic? Thank you so much, Dr. Gelb, for having me. It's really an honor to be speaking with you today. So ocular aesthetics, I mean, definitely not something that came to me naturally. I'm not very good at my own makeup, and I feel like I just barely put myself together most days. Um, but I found when I was out in patient care that first year out of school, I got so many questions from my patients about makeup. It was really a surprise. So you go through the whole exam, you talk to them about their really pertinent medical and visual conditions, and then you ask, do you have any other questions? And my patients were like, yeah, what mascara should I use? And I didn't know. I didn't know the answer. It's not something that's covered in our curriculum in optometry school. So I, I kind of really took it upon myself to let's investigate. I didn't want to just tell them the name of the mascara I was using because maybe it wasn't the best one and I didn't have a scientific reason to recommend it. Um, and that research led to this focus in ocular aesthetics. So what is the impact on our economy with all this makeup that people use? I mean, women put you know about 170 different chemicals on their body a day. Men use uh, 80 different products in general, different chemicals they put on the day, kids and teenagers. What is this doing to us? And what does it do to our economy? What's it doing for us? Well, the cosmetics industry in America is huge. Um, in 2019, it was a $532 billion industry, if that tells you anything. And it's not just women. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Men also are big spenders when it comes to cosmetic products. Um, there's a 2017 survey of 2,000 American men and women that I like to cite, and the average spend for a woman is $3,756 a year on cosmetic products. A man spends on average $2,928 per year. Over the course of a lifetime, that's adding up to over $200,000 for the average person. So yes, we spend a lot of money on looking good. It's really incredible. Talk about what, uh, the millennials, what they're doing to this category. So millennials, you're looking at ages 19 to 39. They are the biggest spenders when it comes to cosmetic products. And we really kind of see that across all areas of cosmetics, whether it's your drugstore cosmetics or your high-end luxury cosmetic products. Um, and they're much more likely to be getting their information from, instead of um, salespeople or trusted researchers or gurus like a doctor or an esthetician, from beauty influencers, from people who are just regular people on Instagram using a new product that they got off the shelf and really don't have any medical experience or training to be making those recommendations. So they're using more products and also getting less informed insights into why they're using the products that they're using. And what do you think that people are listening to people on the internet rather than listening to doctors? So I, we see this across all medical care, um, not just when it comes to cosmetics, but when you have something wrong with your eye, what's the first thing that you do? Or like a, a tickle in the back of your throat, you put it into Google. We want to see like, oh, what should I do about this? What could this be? The internet has been a great equalizer where we feel like we're empowered to be able to research or learn anything that we can type into a search bar. But the con of that is you, you have to know what to type in to get the information back that's useful. Um, and so when you're searching generically, you'll never find out about these preservatives and certain products that have major side effects for you. And that's the risk and the danger that we run into when we're introducing a bunch of cosmetic products to our body. 
not even speaking about the eye, but the body in general. What do all these chemicals and these cosmetics do to our hormones? So we are just beginning to understand what some of the long-term side effects can be. One of the, the big uh, preservatives that we see when it comes to cosmetics are something called parabens. And many um, people who are, are researching or look into cosmetics are familiar with um, this clean beauty movement or organic beauty movement where a lot of products are paraben free. Well, parabens are preservatives found in makeup, sunscreens, soaps and shampoos. They mimic estrogen in our body and they can be absorbed even through skin tissue. Um, studies have shown there might be a correlational risk with things like breast cancer. So when you've got a chemical that mimics a naturally occurring hormone, it's changing up those same hormonal paths in our body that our normal estrogen should be kind of creating and controlling. So introducing these foreign hormones, we don't know how much of the long-term impact that can be, but we have seen some correlations to major serious medical conditions that are, are quite scary. I've seen some scientists write and speak on what estrogens do to like frogs mm -hmm. and how it changes, how it changes their hormones and it changes their, their sex organs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, as a, a woman who um, was pregnant last year, gave birth earlier this past year, hormones and how they fluctuate can greatly change your body when it comes to your diet, your mood, your fluid retention, gaining weight, things changing shape within your body, um, stress levels, and how your body responds to stress. So it's above and beyond even just how you physically look or what an organ does, um, but how you feel and react to different things can be affected as well. So we're talking about um, potentially impacting things like depression or mood as well with these hormones. Um, but yes, we know that extra estrogen in the body can cause extra growth of cells. We see this in things like breast cancer, where the cell turnover rate becomes much higher and you almost get tumors developing from these extra or influx of estrogen hormones. So are there certain uh, cosmetics that we could use that are organic and is that any better? So it all depends. Here, the interesting thing about these terms like clean beauty and organic is there's no meaning behind them in and of themselves. The FDA does not regulate over-the-counter cosmetic products like they regulate a medication when you get something from the pharmacy. In fact, the only legislation on the books that regulates cosmetics is an act from 1938, and it says that they can't be mislabeling of products. That's the only rule. And that doesn't mean organic or hypoallergenic is a mislabel. You can put that on anything. It has no meaning. Um, the only thing that is governed by the government is if you say your product has ingredient X in it, then it's got to have ingredient X. If you don't mention that it has ingredient Y, but ingredient Y is in there, that's mislabeling. So the labels have to say what ingredients are found inside, but clean or organic doesn't have any universal or set meaning. So when you're looking at a product and you see, oh, it's organic, you still need to turn around and look at the labels to see what preservatives are found inside because company A may say it's organic, but they still have five preservatives in it that we know can be toxic or irritating. And company B's organic label might mean none of those preservatives are found inside. Why is it that in Europe, over 1300 chemicals have been banned in uh, beauty products, but in the United States, it's only about 11. Mm -hmm. Well, we've definitely seen that the United States lags behind greatly when it comes to governance of the cosmetics industry. And it's because we don't have legislation on file that would set these kind of regulations. We talked about the last act that was passed was in 1938. And many ingredients and new research has come out since then, as you can imagine, but we've had no update to our legal regulation of this industry since that time. And with the state of, kind of our political system right now, it's not a surprise to hear it's hard to get new laws or tougher laws passed. Um, but I do think that there's a big momentum. In fact, multiple bills have been put forward in both the Senate and the House to 
add more legis legislation on what makeup ingredients can be contained, um, but nothing's moved forward to actual law yet. I often, and I'm sure you do too, get a, uh, it's usually a female patient between 50 and 65, 50 and 70, who comes into my office, has been to a number of doctors with a bag of eye drops, and they say their eyes are burning. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out they're using wrinkle cream. They, a lot of times, I have to say, they don't want to admit it, but eventually they do, and we take them off their wrinkle cream just to try it, and the burning goes away. First of all, does wrinkle cream work? And second, what is in that stuff that burns people's eyes? So most wrinkle creams have what's called retinol in it. And retinol, it does work. Um, what it's going to do is increase cell turnover. So it's making the epithelial cells on your skin shed faster and faster and trying to increase the amount of new cells that you're creating, more collagen production, more elastin production to kind of pump everything up. But when you're increasing that flaking off and, and sloughing of dead cells and trying to reinvigorate new cell growth, it dries the skin out. So no surprise, it can dry the skin around the eye out too. And where do people tend to want to apply it? Well, around their crow's feet. So much of that cream can migrate in to and around the eye. And what people will typically see as a side effect of using retinols around the eye is their eyelids going to be really red, kind of rough. And, and scaly and dry, and then of course the burning that you mentioned. Um, retinols, if they get into the eye, can cause some pretty serious effects to the tear glands. We have glands that run in our top and bottom lid that every time we blink, liquid comes out, and they're called our mabubian glands. Retinols can kill those glands off, so not only can it be short-term irritation, but it can lead to chronic dry as well. So even though, yes, wrinkle creams do work at increasing cell turnover, you wanna be very, very careful about where you apply it around the eye. I always tell my patients, you wanna use a wrinkle cream, hey, I totally understand. I need to use one too, because it's a good way to prevent deep wrinkles from forming. But use a barrier around your eye so it doesn't get too close. The brow bone here, you don't wanna put anything below it. And then we've got a bone here, kind of sep separates our cheek and above it's the, the eye's orbit. Don't go above that. So if you stay on the bony rim and don't go inside of the bones, you're gonna be good. What kind of side effects do people get in their eye, ocular side effects from makeup? If you could walk us through that from front to back. Yeah, so cosmetics can affect basically every layer on the surface of the eye. Um, and that's why we can get such serious irritation from it. Um, makeup is mostly oil-based. And guess what else is oil-based? Our tears, the tear film. So the very top layer of the tears, the liquid that naturally should sit on the surface of the eye is oil. And makeup can go in, oils stick to those oils and destabilize everything. What that's going to make happen is a lot of times your eyes will water more because it's missing the oil that holds it to the eye, so the water is just going to kind of spill off. Um, and then also can lead to dryness because you're missing that oil layer that protects against evaporation. Now above and beyond that, once you get past the liquid tears onto the actual eye surface, makeup can cause some pretty serious effects there too. So on the cornea, which is the clear dome on the surface of the eye, so the part of the eye actually that we, we see through that front shell, makeup and the preservatives specifically found inside of cosmetic products can kill those cells of the cornea off. It can kill off the cells on the white of the eye, it's called our conjunctiva, but the, the white cells on the outside. It can affect the skin cells along our eyelid. It can kill the mybomian glands that we talked about. So basically every layer on the front of the eye from tear film and back can be irritated or even cell death from these products. So what do we tell our patients that are killing tissue on her eye? I think, you know, here's my rule of thumb. I think where many doctors will fail is when a patient says to them, oh, my makeup really irritates my eye doctor, what can I do? And the doctor says, stop wearing makeup. <laughs> That, unfortunately, while yes, many people will say, well, that's the solution, it's not practical. Um, how someone feels about themselves, their self-confidence, 
that's going to be greatly impacted by their ability to feel like they're putting their, their, their best face forward, if you will, to the public. So we can't underestimate the emotional toll it would be on a person to say, well, just don't wear any makeup at all. Um, instead, I empower my patients to look for the ingredients that are going to be known irritants and make informed choices. I want them to still be able to wear makeup, but they're going to have to be more careful about the products that they use and how they apply them than someone else who's not irritated by the preservatives found in makeup. And I'll give them a list of ingredients to avoid and, and kind of go through the best way to put it on their face to minimize irritation. Let's talk about that list, but we'll wait a little bit about on that. Let's, let's talk about dark circles under the eye. What, what is that? What can we do about it? So dark under eye circles, this is a very common problem, especially with the lifestyle that many of us lead, because when we go through the causes, you'll see that it's very much um, the world we live in that's causing that. Under eye circles in and of themselves, it's very normal. Our skin and the eyelid is some of the thinnest skin in the body. And underneath our skin, we have blood vessels. And those blood vessels, when we're tired, when we're stressed, when we've had long hours at the computer, when we're dehydrated, those blood vessels are going to dilate. They'll get bigger. And when we've got bigger blood vessels underneath the skin, it's going to make our skin look more purple or, or blue. That's what creates dark under eye circles. Now, just naturally, as we age, our skin gets thinner. And so that's why many people will notice a difference when they're 30 versus when they're 20, or when they're 40 versus when they're 30. Um, we lose about 1% of the collagen and elastin, which is kind of the, the plumping stuff, if you will, underneath our skin every year that we're alive. So that's why as each decade passes, we're gonna feel like our under eye circle appearance is getting worse. Um, but luckily, there are some things we can do to try to minimize that appearance. What are they? Yeah, so the first one is a more healthy lifestyle. Drinking more water is really, really important because if we're dehydrated, those blood vessels dilate. Um, so there's no magic rule about how much water we need during the day, but pretty much all of us aren't drinking enough. Um, I always tell people if you can do four to six eight ounce glasses a day, you're doing a really good job, um, but more is, is better. Um, sun protection, anything that causes damage to our skin, that can thin our skin earlier or faster, is going to make this appearance worse. So we want to protect our skin, and sun protection is the best way to, to help minimize those free radicals and UV damage that cause aging appearance. Um, so wearing your sunglasses when you're outside is really important to minimize this. Getting a good night's sleep. If we're tired, our under eye circle appearance is going to be worse. And then the other thing is computer and screen time. One of the worst things that makes our body really tired is long hours at the computer. We have a dark room. The only light source is the screen. And the wavelength of light emanating from our screen is more of a high energy blue wavelength type of light. And we know that that messes with our sleep cycles and can make us more tired. So people will notice at the end of the day, after they've been on computer for long hours, oh my gosh, my under eye circles look so worse, so much worse. Well, being in a dark room with this high energy blue wavelength light kind of emitting from you and sitting and not moving around, it puts our body into to rest mode. When we get into that kind of nighttime mode or rest mode, our blood vessels naturally dilate and we're going to see a worsening of our under eye circles. Dr. Love, you might have seen this from your own patients. Many of my patients will tell me, I started wearing these computer glasses, doc, and now I feel like my under eye circles are really bad. Actually, it's the computer and using the computer that's making the under eye circles bad. But computer glasses can actually be protective and help. Um, I like recommending for my patients who are spending long hours at the computer, um, different sort of glare coatings or blue blocker coatings to try to minimize some of that light coming into the eye that can upset that sleep-wake cycle. So hopefully kind of protecting against some of the blue light dilation. But you know, the best thing for it, if you are noticing like, oh, my dark circles are really bad during the day, getting up, walking around more, drinking more water, making sure you're not sitting in a dark room, have good light, natural outdoor lighting, and then going to bed at a decent time and making sure you're not using that computer late into the night. 
a lot of my patients ask me if by using tea bags, does that actually help? Does it do anything? Um, so it depends. Their green tea actually does have some principles on this. Um, so what we want in a tea bag is caffeine. Caffeine is a natural pick me up. And so we talked about the core issue with dark under eye circles is a dilated blood vessel. How do we get our body like up and moving besides exercise or jumping around? If we want to constrict those blood vessels down, caffeine is going to do a real trick. So drinking coffee, drinking a caffeinated tea, or your body can potentially with a, a green tea or a caffeinated tea, if you put a, a tea bag against the closed eye, absorb the caffeine that way as well. A cool tea bag actually does a really good job too because the cold temperature naturally is going to cause blood vessel constriction as well. So you want to avoid a hot um, tea bag because heat will make your blood vessels dilate. Also, people ask me, how long should they keep their makeup for? Let me ask the expert. Yeah, well, here's the good news. Everybody can be an expert because on each one of your products, there is going to be a little indicator marking that tells you the lifespan of that product. For some products like foundations or creams, it might be as long as 12 months. Um, for mascaras, three months is a maximum. And disposing them monthly, I think there's good evidence to support that too. Studies have been done to see what happens with mascara and it's pretty disturbing. So think about mascara. You've got this tube of pigmented oil product in this nice dark cavity and you're rubbing it onto your eyelid every single day and putting it back into the tube. I mean, this is a perfect Petri dish for bacteria growth. And at the end of a three month cycle, studies have shown that over a third of mascara tubes have strep bacteria, staph bacteria, even fungus inside. And you don't wanna be taking that fungus and, and step and strep bacteria and wiping it all over your eyes. Um, no wonder it would cause redness and irritation. So three months max. How should we store makeup? So and kind of as directed, you don't want to keep them in any sort of like moist environment. A clean environment is really good. I always tell people to, you know, if you see that you've got excess product kind of a crusting along the edges, you want to remove that so you get a nice tight seal and then just kind of clean, dry at room temperature, not extreme heat, not extreme cold. Anything that's going to upset the um, preservatives or the, the kind of melting point of the product could make things more prone to getting bacterial growth. A lot of people have bags under their eyes and they really, it really bothers them and they want to know what they could do about it. So the backs under the eyes is kind of similar to that dilated blood vessel effect, right? What causes dark under eye circles. So as those blood vessels dilate to become dark, fluid can also leak from the dilated blood vessel into the surrounding skin. And that's what causes the puffiness of the bags. Um, so in addition to some of the things we talked about, like drinking more water and, and making sure we're getting a good night's sleep, there are some quick pick me up perks that you can do for puffy under eyelids. Cold is your friend. So whether it's um, uh, putting a, a spoon in the refrigerator and then holding it against the, um, your closed eyelid to depuff, or you'll see many of these under eye creams that say they reduce puffiness of the eyes have a cool metal applicator. It's a very smart design. So yes, you're putting on a cream that's going to try to hydrate the skin underneath, but that cool touch of the metal applicator will immediately depuff. And then look for caffeine in your under eye cream products. Um, things like um, we talked about tea based caffeine um, can also kind of cause constriction um, to the puffiness of those under eye circles. Now in kind of a more aggressive approach, if you've tried creams and cool compresses and that more all natural approach there. Another way to move forward is through um, kind of in-office procedures like fillers and Botox, and that can kind of restore muscle acquisition, build up kind of the thickness of the skin with fillers and prevent some of that liquid or from pooling underneath the skin that causes the puffy appearance. A lot of patients use cucumbers. You know, you see these magazines and they're sitting with the cucumbers on the eye. Does that have any benefit? 
Yeah, I mean, it does make sense. So cucumbers are cool. And so we talked about that cold temperature shrinks the blood vessels, pulls fluid back into the blood vessels, right? And then cucumbers naturally themselves have a super high water content. So to a certain degree, they're hydrating and moisturizing. And hydrating will also help reduce the appearance. Now, that medicine for the bags on the their eyes, I've had patients ask me, is that the same as hemorrhoid cream? Um, so I actually, I'm not super familiar with that kind of uh, idea. I've seen, okay, so there is a, a medication for bags under the eyes that is a prostaglandin analog base, and how it works is a bit different than uh, how a hemorrhoid cream works. But what it does is, Prostaglandin is a natural occurring kind of um, inflammatory mediator within our body. But when you apply it specifically to the eye, it can actually shrink the fat pads that we have around our eye in the orbit that can make kind of the, the eyelid look more puffy because you got a thicker pat, fat pad there. So it'll kind of shrink that appearance down with time. The con on a prostaglandin analog cream for under eye circles though is it can cause almost like a sunken appearance where your eyes look like they're sitting deep within the eye. It's not reversible. And it can also increase the appearance of dark circles. So yeah, it might look less puffy because you've got less of a fat pad here, but it's darker. So pros and cons, I, I haven't personally gotten so that I recommend that in any way uh, as I feel like the side effects are worse than the issue. While we're talking about prostaglandins, let's talk about serums to grow eyelashes. Mm -hmm. How does that work? What is that? So you hit the nail on the head on that one. It's exactly how they work. So prostaglandins, we've been using in eye care for a really long time. We know that they treat glaucoma, which is a condition that can blind people. And what we found that when our patients were using these prostaglandin drops for glaucoma is that they were getting these really nice, long, luscious eyelashes. Well, a very um, entrepreneurial spirit at the company that was making some of these medications decided, well, why don't we market it for eyelash growth? And that's where Latisse was born. It's the prescription eyelash growth serum. And it works. Okay, using Latisse, you apply it with a wand onto your eyelids. It will make your eyelashes longer, thicker, darker. Um, typically take somewhere between six weeks to two months to get a full effect. But we also know it has side effects. In the Latisse studies, 4% of users got redness, irritation, stinging, burning, chronic dry eye issues. All right, and because prostaglandins create inflammation, that's what they do, that's the type of hormone and chemical that it is, it's no surprise that it's creating infl inflammation on the eye as a side effect. Now, what people often don't realize, because when you get a prescription for Latisse, all of those side effects are very clearly labeled and listed. When you're buying it over the counter, lash growth serum, not necessarily something that they're gonna advertise or mention because legally, like we talked about earlier, they do have to because it's over the counter. But the ingredient inside that you want to look for is something called isopropyl cloprostinate. This is a synthetic prostaglandin analog. It's got a very similar chemical structure. And even though there's been no FDA studies on this chemical because it's not something under FDA regulation. Um, it has the same side effect profiles that we would expect because it's mimicking a, a chemical that we know has side effect profile. Um, and so redness, irritation, dry eye, um, you're kind of crusting along the eyelashes or burning or stinging. All of that is potential side effects from over-the-counter lash growth serums as well. I tell my patients that longer lashes is what they're wanting to achieve and look for. Um, they need to be informed. Look for that ingredient on the back of their product and know that these side effects are possible. If they experience any redness or irritation, they should immediately discontinue using it because the damage can be permanent. Do you ever recommend any over-the-counter eyelash growth serums? I personally do not. And at the same time, I understand that some of my patients do want longer lashes and they're irritated by mascara. 
false eyelashes have their own side effect profile where we're using glue to adhere fake lashes onto the surface of that, the eyelid. That glue can be irritating. It can cause things like styes and bacterial growth along the eyelid. So there's no way to achieve that longer eyelash look that doesn't have some risk of side effects. But I think our patients need to be educated on what ingredients are in those things and what side effects are possible. So they know if they experience irritation, they need to stop immediately. So if you're gonna recommend it as a doctor, typically you'll use the prescription one, the Latisse. I typically will use the prescription because at least I know if that particular formulation, it's only 4% of people that will get the side effects. Where I don't have any study data or research data to show the percentage of people using over-the-counter growth serum, how many of them will get a dry eye issue side effect. Um, and it could be a lot higher than 4%. We just don't have any studies because the companies have no reason to perform these studies that have a negative impact to them. I've seen people who use prescription eyelash serum where their eyelashes actually fell out and they would have patches of missing eyelashes. Have you ever seen that? Yes, it is possible. So some of the side effects of um, Latisse, where we do have the study shown, have shown that um, you can get almost like an allergic reaction to the prostaglandin analog. You'll get swollen eyelids and damage to the root of the lashes that can cause lash fallout. Um, and again, this is one of those where the irritation typically is going to happen within one or two uses. You're going to know if you're having a negative reaction to it and you'd want to discontinue right away instead of continuing to use the product and then continuing to have the lash fallout. Yeah, I've seen their eyelid, eyelids get purple as well. Yes, darkening of the eyelids is a very common side effect. And again, that darkening, it can be permanent. So it's something that you don't wanna to continue to ignore and keep using because you might live with it the rest of your life. So let's talk, let's go back to the different ingredients that they put in cosmetics, preservatives. Speak about each one. What are the dangers? What are the risks, if there are any, with each one? So this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanna go over the big ones that I feel like everyone should know and recognize and should know to avoid. The first one is called BAK or benzalkonium chloride. It's a preservative that's found in, in many makeup products and a lot of eye drops as well. Um, and it is really toxic to the surface of the eye and the cornea. It can cause death, of the cells with very minimal use. Just 15 minute exposure can kill off your corneal cells, okay? So if you think about a cream or a makeup product that you're putting on all day, you're getting a lot more than 15 minutes of exposure with it. And what do dead cells mean to you as the patient who would be experiencing this? Pain, tingling sensation, your eye might look red in the mirror, your vision could be very blurry. So just kind of that irritation, discomfort, blurry or distorted vision side effects. Uh, other ones to look out for are formaldehyde releasing preservatives. This is a whole category of preservatives. They have lots of long and strange names. So um, what I tell my patients to do is when you get to a word on the ingredient list that you don't know what that is, put that into Google and it will kind of pull up what kind of preservative that is um, because there's you know 40 50 of these that release formaldehyde as they bake down all of us know formaldehyde you think about um, when you were doing dissections in high school and you had the frogs and you open it up and it like oh, it smells terrible those are really strong preservative um, and very very toxic when you get to certain concentrations in the united states we have no regulations on how much of the preservative you can have in your products. Um, this is a preservative that is commonly found in shampoos and soaps, foaming cleansers. It used to be in, in baby shampoo, and only after a lot of public backlash was it removed in the last few years. Um, and so studies have shown that it could increase the risk not only of, of redness, irritation, dry skin, eczema, it can also cause potential side effects like nasopharyngeal cancers. And that's why in the European Union, it's actually banned at concentrations of over 0.2%. Um, we talked about parabens earlier. Parabens are the ones that are preservatives that mimic estrogen in our body. So they can have hormonal side effects. 
research has shown that estrogen is very tied to tear production and the tear production pathway, which is why many women will notice as they go through menopause, their eyes get drier, their skin gets drier. This is kind of dryness is somehow in oil production and estrogen are related to each other. So we're still understanding exactly this complicated pathway. Um, but mimicking estrogen with the preservative can definitely disrupt tear film and cause dryness as a side effect. And we talked about there are even some studies that suggest maybe a risk of things like breast cancers as a side effect. And then the last one is one that's super common, phenoxyethanol. Phenoxyethanol you're gonna find even in your sensitive face washes like um, Cetaphil or, or things that say dermatology approved. So these labels, hypoallergenic, dermatologically tested, doesn't mean that you shouldn't flip around and read what ingredients are actually inside because a common side effect of phenoxyethanol is redness, eczema, skin allergies, if you've ever had someone that has a lot of flaky skin along their top and bottom eyelids, a lot of times that's from either a face wash or a cosmetic creating this kind of localized irritation. And discontinuing the product is going to make that eyelid eczema go away. So are there products out there that doesn't have this stuff in it? Absolutely. And one of the best places to find them, there's a website called pettivore.com, P-E-T-I-T-V-O-U-R.com. I don't personally get into the habit of recommending X brand or one brand of products because all products have some sort of preservative inside to minimize bacterial growth. I mean, these are products that are, your, are liquid, that are oil, so that bacteria lives them already, and you're touching your face and you're touching it. So bacteria growth is a real problem here. We need something to limit the bacterial growth in our products. Um, but you can research and find on that website multitude of different companies, and they're not all expensive. You can get you know, your normal $10, $20 products all the way up to your $100, $200 products on this website um, that are free of all of these preservatives. What is quinterium that sometimes is in these products? Yeah, so quaternium-15 is specifically, but quaternium in general, it's one of those formaldehyde-releasing preservatives that we were talking about. And it's the one that's really, really commonly found in foaming cleansers. Um, used to be, like we said, in Johnson's Baby Shampoo until they recently changed the formulation. But look for it in your shampoos, in your face washes. You can even really commonly find them in um, eyelid cleansing scrubs. So if you're having a patient who's got that eyelid irritation and you're having them use eyelid uh, foaming wipes and they're still having irritation and telling you their eyes aren't feeling any better, they may have a sensitivity to quaternium 15 as a heads up. Hmm. Wow. So let's talk about, you brought up mascara before. Tell me the good, the bad, the ugly about mascara. I, you know, we, I examine patients, you do, we all do, and people have mascara and it just kind of lays there like, uh, like rocks. <laughs> that is so true. So mascara, the reason why it's such a big irritant, and studies have shown it's a huge irritant. People that wear mascara every day, over 66% of them report daily irritation. <laughs> So if you wear mascara, you're probably irritated by it. And the reason why that is, is because mascara is an oil-based product. And so it sticks to the oils on our skin and the oils on our tear film. When we're applying it, which is right along the eyelash roots, that's right where our oil glands, those vibonian glands we were talking about, that's where the opening is. So it tends to want to stick right together. And then every time you blink, you're putting mascara into your eye. And the Mascara can create irritation from the preservative inside of it, but also just from the pigment itself. It can smear up all over your tear film, make your vision come in and out of focus. It can stick to your contact lenses, make your contact lenses feel really uncomfortable and sticky, especially as the month goes on when you've got 30 days of mascara buildup on there. And we're talking about microscopic buildup. As doctors, we're going to see it when we pull over our microscope, the slit lamp, um, but in patients, you're not going to be able to look in the mirror or look at your contact lens and, and necessarily see like, oh, there's a ton of mascara debris on my contact lens. So how are you supposed to apply mascara the correct, the correct way? Uh, so, there, you know, there's going to be a lot of debate on this one. But what I found 
for looking at research, especially with contact lens wears, the order in which you do your makeup is really important. Um, with mascara, I want to avoid as much as possible getting it in touch with the eye. So I know when you, you know, you look at beauty influencers or people on YouTube telling you how to apply makeup, they're going to talk about really getting along the base and wiggling. For me personally, I would love to see patients apply it more kind of halfway and up towards the edge and avoid getting into contact with the eyelid itself. If you're irritated by mascara, if your eyes get red and irritated, you don't want to put it right along the base because that's where the irritation is going to occur. And then if you're a contact lens wearer, the best order to do this is put on your mascara, then put in every wetting drop. That's going to act like a flush. It's going to clean off all that more mascara deposits that might have kind of fallen off as you were applying into that. Um, let that dry, 30 seconds to a minute, then put in your contact lens. And by doing it in that order, you're actually minimizing the chance that you're gonna get the wand onto the contact lens and put mascara directly onto your contact. And you're also minimizing uh, that loose mascara right after you first apply before it's dry, not getting into touch with your contact lens. How do we get mascara off our face? <laughs> so removing mascara is so important, but it's a step that many of us miss. When you've got an oil-based product, you need an oil-based cleanser. I think most of us have heard that old adage, oil and water don't mix. So if you're wearing mascara and you're trying to take it off with soap and water, you are doing it wrong. It is not going to come off. In fact, what you're probably going to do is just break your eyelashes off um, because there's nothing that's going to kind of remove that adherence of the mascara to your lash root. So oil-based cleansers are going to naturally kind of just remove that mascara right from the base. And then if you need to go back in with a, a foaming cleanser or to remove the oil, you do that as a second step. Um, I always recommend to my patients, don't use waterproof mascara. Waterproof is so much harder to remove. And so it's going to stick around your eye much longer, create more irritation. And there was actually even a, a patient, this is a, a big case report we saw in a bunch of medical journals, she had worn mascara for 25 years, never taken it off at night, and she had a ton of mascara deposits embedded all underneath her top and bottom eyelid, um, and they had to go in because it felt like rocks, literally, as she was blinking, where this mascara stuff was all inside of her eyelids. Um, had to flip her eyelids under and physically remove all of the mascara deposits. So taking your makeup off nightly and using a product that's going to come off better. So avoiding waterproof mascara is the best way to go. So we want to avoid oil-based mascara. So is there water-based mascara? Are there brands that are actually say water-based? They're all, all the products are going to be oil-based in their composition. Um, but the waterproof, is just much stronger concentration and not going to budge um, with water. Yeah, so it's just much harder to remove even though all of these products are actually oil-based in origin. Talk about Accutane. A lot of kids get Accutane. What are the side effects as far as the eye is? So you think about what Accutane is prescribed for, chronic pimples. So you think about acne, um, and what acne is, it's a clogged oil gland. Accutane really works. It's going to help constrict those glands, make the oil kind of stiff and harden up, so it's less likely that it's going to get clogged, right, and clear your face up. But let's think about what else is an oil gland on our face. And we talked about those glands on our eyelid, the meibomian glands that every time we blink, liquid comes out of to keep our eyes hydrated. Those are oil glands. Accutane has no way of differentiating oil glands here versus oil glands on your eye. And what we've seen is it can permanently destroy and kill those meibomian glands. So we'll have patients that used Accutane when they were 16, now they're 45, they have no glands. And, and that was the common medical history, was that history of Accutane use decades earlier. How about contact lens wear and Accutane? So, yeah, many of your patients that are on Accutane temporarily will notice 
oh my eyes feel really dry now with contact lenses. Maybe they were happy contact lens wearers before, but now it's really uncomfortable. And it's because the oil within those glands now is hardening and stiffening up and congealing up. Um, and when they blink, less liquid is coming through. So a great thing to do if you have a patient that is in and it started Accutane is to actually start really focusing on their glands. We know that while our glands are still alive and we're at these kind of first stages of oils hardening and congealing and blocking, that heat can be used to open the glands up and restore their flow. So there's certain microwavable heat masks that we can do that I'll have my, my patients start on every night after they take their contact lenses out just to kind of open up the glands and improve their flow. There are in-office heat treatments that can be done, but the point is to treat it right from the start. Don't wait until they're 45 and haven't been able to wear contact lenses for 30 years to start doing these heat treatments because at that point the damage is already done. We need to kind of educate our patients when they're very young, when they're 16 and just starting, hey, you might get these side effects. We're going to do XXX to prevent that from happening. How often should they have these heat treatments if they are using Accutane? How often, I'm sorry. How often should they do these heat treatments if they're using Accutane? I think it depends a little bit on how severe. So what I will do in the office to evaluate the glands is just put a little gentle pressure with my finger. They also make little applicators that you can use to, to test to see what the expression is like. If it's just a little bit thickened, maybe a little less than perfect gland expression, I'll have them do the microwavable um, heat pad once, maybe at nighttime. If it's really congealed, if I can see like toothpaste coming out, that, I need it twice a day. Just doing it once might be not enough. Um, so one to two times a day, depending on severity. And how about those in-office treatments where you have to heat it up and express the meibomian glands? Mm -hmm. So that heat is a lot more targeted. And for some patients, uh, at-home microbial heat mask is just not going to be enough. In-office treatments get to temperatures over 108, maybe up to 110 degrees. So much, much hotter, definitely than a hot washcloth that you apply, but even with the, the better microwavable versions. Um, and those treatments may need to be repeated as often as every year or two, depending on the type of or version, maybe more frequently than that, because there's different versions of these treatments now available. How about eyelid tattooing? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like her tattooing, so many people <laughs> will um, get this done. <laughs> because they, they're like, oh, putting on eyeliner every day is really irritating. And the reason why eyeliner is such an irritant to the eyes is what's the popular way to apply it is something called tight lining. And that's where you actually pull your eyelid down and you apply the eyeliner inside of the eyelash roots on the waterline, which is where all the glands are. So you're basically coating up and covering and blocking all your glands up on purpose for some reason. And then no surprise, it makes your eyes really irritated. Um, so to avoid that, people will get a tattoo of the eyeliner. So they get the look of eyeliner without the daily irritation. The con of this is, well, yeah, it's a tattoo on your eyelid. So the first couple of days, your bruise is painful, it's sore, you might get a lot of redness, but with time, that, that heals. Long term, though, it kills the meibomian glands, studies have showed. So that physical trauma where you're piercing that eyelid skin with the needle and injecting pigment traumatizes the glands, blocks the glands, kills them off, so you're left with permanent dry eye just as if you were putting it on every single day with your hands. So both ways is really bad. If you're going to put on eyeliner, just apply it no higher than your eyelash roots. Don't go onto that waterline because that's when the, the damage gets done. Explain the different glands in the eye that produce the tears. You mentioned my yeah. glands, if you could explain that. So we've got two major systems going on when we talk about tears. A lot of my patients, when I say, oh, we're seeing where your glands aren't working really well and you have dryness, and they'll tell me, my eyes water all the time. I don't have any trouble with tears. But we've got two different systems. So the glands that are responsible for our just everyday, how our eyes stay hydrated when we blink, those glands are the meibomian glands that run in our top and bottom eyelids. So we've got about 30 up top, about 20 on the bottom, give or take. 
and when you blink, liquid comes out. These glands are very, very important to how our eyes feel on a regular basis. The other system is what we call reflex tearing. It's from a gland up underneath our eyebrow called the lacrimal gland. And these glands produce the water-based tears that come out when we're crying emotionally. When we get something in our eye and our eye starts to water to flush it out, that's a backup system when it comes to a dry eye. So if you're someone who has chronic eye irritation and then your eyes pour water, it's because you're missing the action of our normal regular tear system on the eyelids and relying on the backup system. So the only way to keep your eyes from watering is to restore the function of these glands in the eyelid that are supposed to be working every time you blink. You mentioned before about the fake lashes and the glue that could affect people's eyes. Speak, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so false eyelashes, just like lash to hair, is super popular right now. Uh, eye, long eyelashes are really having a moment. And false eyelashes, what happens is you're going to use a glue to actually glue either a strip or individual lashes to your own eyelash lid margin. The glue in and of itself can be an irritant, can cause an allergic reaction. So if you're gonna get this done, always get a skin test first. They're gonna put it a little bit on, you know, maybe on your wrist or on your hand to see if you have an allergic reaction to the glue. If you don't, then theoretically, you should not have an allergic reaction to your eyelid either. During the process though of them applying this, sometimes the glue can actually get into the eye or around the glands and create some redness and irritation from that. Um, so I, if a patient has recently had um, false eyelashes applied and they're getting a lot of irritation, redness, burning, stinging, really my only real way to resolve it um, is to have them go back to the salon and have them use something to dissolve the glue and remove it. Okay. Um, so long term, let's say everything goes well with the application, you got the false lashes, the other big mistake patients will make is not to clean them. So the glue, if you use um, oil-based cleansers like we would typically to remove makeup, it will break down the glue. And so the false eyelashes you just paid a couple hundred bucks for will be gone in like a week. And people don't want to do that, right? Um, so they'll avoid cleaning altogether. That's a mistake because the glue naturally will start harboring bacteria and lid debris and you can get styes, you can get eyelids infections. So we want to clean around an area using a foaming more soap-based cleanser. I really like something with um, tea tree oil extract inside because tea tree oil is more natural anti-inflammatory and helps fight against um, the common mites and, and irritants that make up a lot of eyelid infections. Um, that helps reduce that risk while you can still kind of expand the lifespan of your lashes, if you will. So can people actually have mites living on their eyelashes? Yeah, in fact, we all do. That's a kind of scary take home. But um, just like we have bacteria on our skin at all times, that's normal. That helps support our healthy immune system. We all have these little mites on our skin called Demodex mites. They're very small. You're not going to look in the mirror and see them. Um, your dogs have them, your cats have them. It's just a normal part of being alive. But when we get too many of them, when we tip the scale where there's an excess population, if you will, they can create chronic redness, irritation, trouble with dry eye. Um, and we see this, especially in our patients that have rosacea. So if your skin type, you're really prone to flushing, you have a lot of redness around your nose or on your cheeks, um, there's definitely a high correlation between that chronic redness and higher populations of Demodex. So using something like a tea tree oil based cleanser to reduce the Demodex population can improve your symptoms. Um, other treatments that are getting really popular is something called IPL or intense pulse light. That constricts those blood vessels and kind of dries up where they might be leaking out um, and, and also and by doing so, controlling the Demodex populations. So people are getting these IPL treatments, not just to treat their facial rosacea, but you can do it if you have chronically red eyes as well around the eyelid. Now we've pulled Demodex off people's eyelashes and we see the mouth moving and they mm -hmm. actually have these live little mites. I guess they have a lot of them. And the mm -hmm. treatment for that again is? 
is a tea tree oil-based cleansers. Um, there's all different name brands of, of medical grade cleansers. Claridex is a one that we oftentimes will use in the office. But then long term, you can use um, diluted tea tree oil shampoo, for example, or I like to get kind of prepared tea tree oil uh, eyelid cleanser specifically. So you don't have to do any like at home chemistry and diluting things down. Um, you can get this at the drugstore. We Love Eyes is a really good brand that is in CVS even now, or you can get it on Amazon. So a lot of different places to find these that are specifically formulated to clean the eyelid. If you do want to clean your eyelid and you have a lot of cakey stuff on your eyelid, how often do you recommend doing it and for how long do you need yeah. So again, this a little depends of person to person. If you wear makeup, you need to be removing it at least nightly. For most of my patients that are having rosacea or chronic dry eye issues or maybe prone to styes or prone to eye infections, I would say once a day. And then you're cleaning right along the eyelash roots, get right into the base of the lashes, tops and bottoms. You know, nothing excessive. We're not trying to scrub. It's not like the skin needs to come off, but just kind of massaging into the area where bacteria or the dimidoxinites tend to cluster. And they live within the glands and the hair follicles of those lash roots. So getting into the bases of the lashes is the place that you want to go when you're cleaning. 30 seconds to a minute, maybe two minutes on the long end as far as how long to clean for. If I have a patient who has an active infection, at the doctor, they'll sometimes call it blepharitis, which is inflammation of the eyelid, or you have a sty that's going on where you've got infected, clogged tear glands in your eyelid. I might do as many as two or three times a day, depending on the severity. But for maintenance, once a day is a great thing to do. We talked about the eyelids growing before. Uh, how about for me to put it on my head? Well, I grow, can I grow hair with that stuff? So the, the verdict is out, but there's no science to really support it, unfortunately. How the lash follicles work in, the, in their growth cycle is apparently very different than our hair growth cycle. And I've had a few patients experiment to see like, oh, let me just put it in like my scalp. And then we, in this in-office trial, they didn't really experience any effect. So I think there's a reason why we haven't seen a pharmaceutical company marketing it for hair growth yet. It seems like it's a different action. Uh, shucks. Okay. <laughs> now, what are some beauty products in, in wrapping up here that we should avoid? You know, I know they have these little fiber stuff. I see sometimes floating around people's tears. Can you mention that? Yeah. Oh, that's a big one. Okay. So we talked about avoid waterproof mascara. The other mascara you definitely want to avoid are these fiber-based mascaras. The idea behind them was, okay, well, you want thicker, fuller, bigger lashes. We're going to put all these little synthetic fibers into the mascara tube. So when you coat on your mascara, you get a bunch of hairs coating on there at the same time. Well, not surprising to any of us, those hairs fall everywhere and I, many of my patients i'll see them floating around underneath their eyelids or on the white of the eye sticking to their contact lenses they're big irritants so definitely avoid that type of, of mascara as well anything and else that we should be avoiding avoiding um uh, any makeup wipes really just avoiding the um eyeliner specifically but avoiding tight lining where you're applying it to the waterline Avoid putting your concealer or any sort of eyeshadow or, or foundation. Avoid getting into the waterline with any product at all because that's where you're going to create major irritation. I do have to ask you about these tattooing of the iris. Mm. Can you talk about that? If people injecting into their eye to change their iris shape, that sounds horrible. It is a horrible idea and it's not something that you're seeing anyone with a medical license in the United States even dreaming of, of doing. But we would, every medical profession highly, highly discourages this. Um, because when you go into the eye and inject something inside, you're actually changing the fluid volume inside the eye. And the side effects of these procedures, people have gotten glaucoma, people have been blinded. So you do not want to implant or inject any sort of dye inside the eye. 
And what should people do if their eyes are irritated from cosmetics? What's the first thing they should do? So the, the first thing you should do is almost do like a, a clean sweep, if you will. When you're going to see your eye doctor, they're going to give you treatments to reduce the inflammation. And during that time, we're going to kind of do a detox on the products that you're using around the eye and just focus on how do I restore the broken cells, reduce the irritation, make everything brand new. Typically, that process is going to take a week, maybe two weeks in a severe case. And at that point, I say, okay, I'm going to see you for a follow up after we're done with this eye drop or whatever treatment we're doing. And I want you to bring every product that you use in and around your face with you. That sometimes it's a really big bag, okay? And this includes face washes, uh, night creams, you name it. And at that, that visit, we're gonna go through and look at the preservatives so you can see on the labels, all the different things that could be creating eye irritation. Um, in that process, there might even be things where we decide you're not going to use this one anymore. This one has too many ingredients that we know that's an irritant. Um, and maybe we decide, okay, we're going to try this one. Let's give it a couple days. If the irritation comes back, we'll know we have to avoid that preservative. So we can do kind of more of a test to reintroduce things. An alternative is you can actually do skin testing now, kind of like allergy testing or different um, preservatives that are commonly found in cosmetics to find out which preservatives you're irritated by specifically. And then you can look at your labels and say, oh, I can't use this, I can't use that. I need to use a different product instead. Um, so just reading labels becomes the next biggest step to make sure you can use the types of products you wanna use, but you won't get a return to that irritation. And finally, talk about the solutions. If there are any brands you can recommend, again, that other website that you mentioned, where should, what should people look for when they're getting cosmetic products that won't irritate the eye very much or hurt them overall? Yeah, so think about the preservatives specifically that we talked about, um, benzalkonium chloride, the formaldehyde releasing preservatives, parabens, and phenoxyethanol. Okay, so those are the big four that if you're irritated by makeup, you need to actively avoid. Then using resources like the pettyvore.com website that we talked about, or um, ewg.org, which is a database where you can type in the preservatives in your products and see what side effects those preservatives are associated with. So you can look up more than just those four preservatives to see what you might be dealing with. Environmental Working Group. EWG. Yes, yes. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of companies now that are offering clean beauty or organic beauty, but don't just take that label on its face value look up and see when Sephora says clean, what does that mean? What preservatives aren't in there? And still look at the ingredients list on the products and see if there's an irritant on there that you know you have a sensitivity to or that's showing up in an ewg.org research that you've done. Um, because just because this has clean doesn't mean that you aren't going to be irritated by it. Well, thank you for that. And if you do come up with something for my head, for my hair, you let me know, send me an email. <laughs> in my next life okay <laughs> well with that being said i want to thank dr lyerly she's a wealth of information she's an expert in this topic dry eye cosmetics how it affects the eye she's really something and if you and if somebody wants to find out more about you or wants to wants to see you or learn about you on, from the internet please give us all that information yeah, so a great way to find me is on Instagram. I'm at idolatry, E-Y-E dot D-O-L-A-T-R-Y. Idolatry is also the name of my website. So if you type that in to the internet, you'll find my blog and you can communicate with me directly on there too via email. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate spending some time with us and helping educate our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill.